say when. Uh, when, sorry. Go over. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I have to readjust everything. Oh, gosh. Oh, okay. Well, here we go. Hello, welcome. <laughs> if you're new here, my name is Brenna. I am your contingency planning DM, and welcome to Tales from the Catacombs. This is our tabletop RPG adventure that we are thrilled to share with you. Uh, this... Oops, sorry, wrong one. There it is. This game uses the Dungeons and Dragons D20, or sorry, the Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition D20 rules and system, and the setting is a homebrew based off of the rock musical Razia's Shadow by Forgive Durden. We have a brief introduction to the setting that you can read at your leisure, and I hope you will, so that you can be as immersed in the world as our players are. Without further ado, Please enjoy this episode of Razia's Shadow, A Thousand Year Interlude. Let's recap. Session 14, Lunch and Learn. After Viola accepted her personal assignment from the Avenger and checked on Buttercup, the novices had lunch and then gathered their information. Snow determined that the strange blood was not magical in and of itself, but rather it was being preserved with necromantic magic. The blood on Snow's skin left him feeling exhausted, and magic wouldn't clean it from his hands. They expected more answers would come from their emissaries, Moonridge and Vaughn, and from the lead acolyte, Aglin. At Novice Command offices, they met Bria Han, the third novice emissary. She discouraged them from bothering Moonridge on his day off, and she hadn't seen Vaughn since they returned. What Bria could help with was a means to get to Hazelford and still get paid. She suggested, she suggested they help the Peace Watch with missing shipments in Hazelford. She would prepare a request for them. The novices thought through how they might approach Aglin next, since he was their only confirmation about the state of the crown. After some consideration, they decided to wait until the next day so they could rest and better prepare for what might happen. The rest of the day was spent in the library next to Stormwatch Tower. Stayin' and Snow had research to do. Bo found a kindly tutor and a potentially kindred spirit. But Viola had no interest in these studies and wandered outside, where she came across the guard Ziva and her friends. They invited her to explore the magical, technological wonders of Kepner's command. So we are going to do a little bit of... I. I imagine it's going to be a little bit of backtracking so we can go see what Viola's been up to while Bo was deep in his studies uh, for the rest of the day. And Bo made, if you didn't see, you should, Bo made some excellent headway uh, with his new arcane studies. So we're going to jump over to Kepner's Command where uh, Viola was just led inside. Uh, once again, someone putting their arms around her shoulder and she's <laughs> probably at least a few inches taller but it's all meant in you know good spirit so viola you are led inside of this large building kind of the patchwork of materials used to create it um you enter this entrance hall well you go up this little flight of stairs and you enter this entrance hall um it's this wooden foyer it has various framed drawings on the walls that look kind of like schematics um you see some little creations, these like little metal cog work, like clockwork creations, um, cogs and screws, um, things that look, you see some other things that look as simple as like a hand mirror or like a pot of paint. There's this wide variety of things. Um, Ziva leads you in and she's with this little crowd of people. She leads you in further and you are in this hallway there are doors on either side, just a few of them. All of them are closed. You can hear little sounds coming from any given one. Uh, there's drifting smells of various types. Some of it kind of has like a stinging, kind of oily smell. But also from elsewhere, you're getting this drifting of almost like a, like someone's cooking maybe or uh, preparing something, something much nicer than whatever smells like oil. Um, and she explains to you that this floor is kind of more for accommodations, for visitors like yourself. Um, people can come in and visit, but all of the, the real heavy duty kind of training and testing and things like that will happen on other floors. Um, so she 
leads you further down the hall, and there is a stairwell leading down. And she will she will ask you. Um, she says, "So there are there are a lot of things that we can show you." And before I get ahead of myself, because if I start talking, I will not stop. Um, I just want to make sure you're not like running low on time or anything, because you can always come back another time if you need to, and I could show you all manner of things then. Um, one, give me just one second. Let me think about it for a second. Uh, hey, Bo, how much longer <laughs> do you think you're going to be uh, doing your studies things for? Wait, how far back are you reversing the timer here? So it's probably about an hour or so into, um, like, when Bo got settled with Maria and they started going. It's probably about an hour after that. So you're, Would he still have uh, it Maria's, by then? Would he still have it by then, then? Because I think when he was messaging Snow about looking it up, he was down to, like, his last final moments. Like, hour? Yeah. Really? I mean, he cast it back in Nora's house. <laughs> oh. And then by lunch, they still had, like, two hours left, and then you guys... They took an time. hour lunch, <laughs> and then we went and talked and then walked. I'll say... <laughs> I'll say this is the final. Like, you might get cut off, so you better talk quickly. <laughs> you have like 45 seconds left of magical <laughs> communication. Okay. Uh, probably like, I don't know, two, three hours, maybe. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got a few hours, so you can go ahead and show me whatever you're excited about. Like I said, some goggles that help me see in the dark would be really awesome, but I am also excited for other awesome things. And you see this huge grin going across Ziva's face. Um, and she kind of like is squeezing like the end of her braid, like excitedly um, as she takes you over towards the stairwell. And she says, okay, if you want to start with goggles of night, we can handle that. No problem. Um, yeah, let's, Let's actually, since you have time. See, I could just take you into one of these other training rooms. They're very simple, you know, tables, chairs, uh, things set up. And we could just turn the lights out and see how it works. But that doesn't sound like fun at all, now does it? Mm -mm. No, nope. exactly. I'm here for the exciting stuff. Perfect. Have you considered any of this before? Have you ever seen a place like this before? I haven't. Um, I kind of grew up in a bit of a bubble. Um, both my parents are fighters with two weapons or a great sword. And um, my father didn't really teach me much about magic or any sort of magical items. Um, I was always kind of raised to just trust in what you can see and feel and what you can do. But I'm discovering that magic can come in very handy in a tight spot. Um, so, but this is all new to me. I've never thought about it, heard about it. This is all Perfect. kind of my first experience. Perfect. That means you are ripe for the picking. Let's see what we can do for you. And I promise this is not all magic. Not all of it's magic. We just like to, what we do is kind of combine the physical tangible and then also the I don't know how you might phrase it. I, I suppose like a wizard might say like the weaving of the universe or something like that. Who cares? Come on. And so she <laughs> pulls you towards the steps uh, and takes you down. You go down a fair bit. Um, you kind of feel the change in the air almost. Like it starts to feel a little bit more humid. Not so much so that you feel like you're walking through a swamp or anything, but it's like walking into a basement level. Um, and there, this one is more uh, compact. There's just the four doors. Um, no, there's just two doors, one on either side of another hallway. And it is dimmer down here, but it is still lit. And she starts walking with you down this hallway. Uh, you actually see standing or sitting beside one of the rooms. You see a couple of people sitting there already. Um, one is actually the gnomish girl you had seen earlier today, um, in the novice offices. Uh, you see her 
she's uh, sitting against the wall. She seems to be fiddling with something in her hands. Sitting next to her is someone you have not met yet. Uh, it is a young man. He's got fair skin, very bright blonde hair, um, and his he actually has a set of small protective goggles that are pulled up over his head while he is also fiddling with some kind of um, it looks almost like a piece of wood that he seems to be kind of almost whittling down and across from them you see another familiar face although for a moment you're not quite sure it's who you think it is you do see the flush of bright pink hair but it is pulled back in this messy ponytail she's wearing this very basic brown dress with short sleeves um her hair kind of looks like it's fraying and, and like unkept unbrushed and the closer you get you kind of see these specks of like some smudges of dirt on her face she's not wearing any gloves or anything and she has this kind of ratty uh, rag on a on a loop around her belt sitting uh, she's sitting along the opposite wall from the other two and as Ziva is approaching the door she actually calls out to the others and she says oh hey Winna uh, Gary actually it's good timing you're here we have Viola here who uh, is we're going to introduce her to some of the fun gear that we've got in here. She's got a couple of hours to kill. Uh, actually, Cynthia, if you wanted to join too, since you're on your, are you on your break now? And Cynthia turns her head and sees you. And her face goes entirely red. And you can see her <laughs> tense up as she just slowly turns back and she's looking now like straight at the opposite wall uh, instead of looking at you. Um, Winna, the gnomish girl, looks at Ziva and you know she's waving and she kind of gives you a little wave as well, Viola, um, but she politely declines. Uh, Gary, the boy sitting next to her, he almost doesn't seem to hear her as he just keeps whittling. He looks up and he also shakes his head and then he looks at you and, and waves as well. Viola are... will wave back and, and she'll say hello to Winna and she'll say hello to the Cynthia as well. <laughs> Just like her teeth are gritted as you are so kind to her. Um, and she looks back and she kind of like makes her way over to Winna and they start this hushed conversation um, that seems to be like just back and forth, back and forth quickly. Uh, did you want to try and hear what they were saying? Of course I do. <laughs> Please roll me a perception. Mm. Check. That's a nat 20 for a 24. <gasps> okay, then. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, Cynthia maybe is just hoping to just cut you out entirely and hope you're not paying attention. She, like, scrambles over to Winna and she's like, what do you mean you're not going in? And she, when I was like, I, I can come back any time, girl. I don't need to go in now. I know what they're doing. No, you don't understand. I really want to go in there. I really want to try this stuff. I never get to do that. Winna says, you're here all the time. Like, you're working. You know Ziva loves you. You can go in whenever you want. She's like, I'm always working or I'm studying. There's no in-between here. It, I don't make me go in there with her by myself. Um... But uh, Winna just pats her on the shoulder and she's like, You'll be good. Relax. Just go. I'll be right here waiting. And Cynthia finally um, stands and kind of brushes herself off and stands tall. Does not make any kind of eye contact with you whatsoever, Viola. As she approaches Ziva and says, um, That'd be... Great. I really appreciate that. Yeah, what are we uh what are you guys trying today? Diva um <laughs> motions for one of the others, uh one of her friends to uh quickly go 
back upstairs as I realized we didn't grab the things. And they go back up in just a minute, they come right back down and they are holding um, two boxes that went open. There are two small pairs of goggles inside. They kind of have this, uh, the nose guard piece kind of has this like almost beakish look to it. Um, the lenses and the frame around the lenses kind of reach out like feathers, like metal feathers. Um, and she offers one to you, Viola, and one to Cynthia. Cynthia makes a great show of seeming to know exactly what to do as if it were complicated to put a pair of goggles on, but she like fits them very properly on her face. Um, do you take yours? Mm -hmm. Cynthia, those look wonderful on you. And I'm not gonna lie, I've never seen you <laughs> out of like all of your purple and pink and, and flowers and all that, I kind of like this look on you. And then Viola will mimic what she's done and put her goggles on as well. Gonna see. <laughs> We're gonna, ooh, my die got stuck. Okay. Um, Cynthia does slowly turn to you. And it's now her. She she has a night like she has a, a nice appearance, um, but now also these like owl looking goggles on her face. <laughs> uh, she just slowly nods to you. Thank you. You're and welcome. then looks back at Ziva. Um, Ziva explains. Uh, so these are goggles of night. So what they do is. When you are in complete darkness, you'll still be able to see to a certain length as if you could see normally in the dark and the way you see in the light. So what we'll do is give you an opportunity to kind of, instead of just standing in a room, we'll give you an environment to stand in. Uh, kind of feel your way through, just natural, just act natural. Just move like you would move normally. Maybe if you want to swing your sword around a little bit, something like that. Um, yeah. Whenever you're ready, you can go on inside. And she opens this metal door and motions you in. And it, you have the goggles on already? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, she motions for you to go inside. And it, um, you didn't expect necessarily to be able to just see in darkness. And for a moment, you kind of wonder if she even has the lights out in this room, so to speak, because you can see very plainly, um, kind of as if you were, you know, just walking in the daylight. This might be a little more dim, but you can still see. And what you see is this forested, this kind of contained forested area. Uh, the ground beneath your feet uh, kind of crunches a little bit as you're stepping on blades of grass. Um, you see a few trees scattered around, and you can see to the end, if I recall correctly, you can see to the end of the um, of the room. So on the other side of the room is this wall that kind of, it very much looks like it's painted to look like more forest, but it's very obviously painted. Um, so she motions for you to head inside, and you hear Cynthia coming in behind you as well. And then you hear the door close behind you. Uh, she peeks it open one more time and says, natural movements, try it out. And then she shuts the door. Viola will like, first thing she's gonna do is like pop off the glasses to see if it like actually looks dark when she's not looking through them. Mm -hmm. And then she'll pop them back on. And then she's going to say, um, Cynthia, do you know how they have, like, a forest underground? It's obviously fake. Or oh. maybe they grew it <laughs> with magic or something. I don't know if you know anything at all about magic. It's very useful. Yeah, I don't know if you heard me earlier talking to um, Ziva. Am I saying that correctly? your name okay sorry i'm i'm not very good with names sometimes i can be a bit of an airhead um but i don't know if you heard me talking to her earlier um oh i'm sorry i didn't realize i told a joke um but uh 
I didn't really grow up with magic. So this is kind of coming to the guardianship a little bit before. Uh, this is kind of the first time for me experiencing it. And it's it's honestly really cool. I'm I'm pretty shocked. Like when we had the vines trial, I mean, that was so cool. That guy, I think it was Vaughn just like snapped his fingers and like vines appeared out of nowhere. That's never something I've seen in my life. Uh, but clearly this isn't new to you. So you're, you grew up with magic. You've known magic stuff all your life. I mean, I learned it eventually. I'm the only one in my family who really can do it. Oh, that's cool. How does that work? Do you know like why your other family members can't do it? Or maybe they choose not to. I don't know. Roll me a persuasion check. Also, Cassie, if you want to see what they look like, I put an image of it in roll 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, 11 for the persuasion. Okay. <laughs> After the minus two of the charisma? <laughs> well, I gave myself uh, proficiency in persuasion, so it's just zero. Ah, <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. She, Heck yeah. <laughs> that was very um, she hmm. kind of looks you up and down, uh, for a moment, and she says, um, because I was the only one who cared enough to learn it. It's very easy to learn. Um, in fact, uh, we should make sure that these goggles are really working well, right? That's why we're here, to give them a try, right? I mean, yeah, we just kind of look through them, and that means that they're working. Right. But are <laughs> they really, really working? See, trust me, like you said, I know magic, and you don't really know magic. But you can learn. So let's let's see if it's really going to work. Sometimes these things get a little temperamental. Um, and she walks out ahead of you a little bit. Um, not too, too far, but she walks a little bit ahead of you. Um, and you can see her through the goggles. You can see her kind of moving her hands a bit, and she says, um, so can you see this? She's moving her hands. Yeah, I can see you moving your hands. Viola will get out her sword and start swinging around. Can you see this? Yeah, yeah, I can. I can, actually. Um, Okay. Well, since you've already got your sword out, how about you make sure that you can see <laughs> if you're ever swinging your sword? Um, can I do an insight check on her if she's trying to do something? <laughs> sure. Go ahead, roll your insight. Y'all are about to duel. <laughs> <laughs> to the death. Fourteen. Okay. Um, give me one moment. Keeping my notes all in check and junk. Um, you you get the sense that she's uh, she's definitely kind of like toying with you a little bit, which it doesn't come to any kind of surprise. <laughs> um, but she's definitely not just asking random questions for sure. Viola's gonna go ahead and pull out her other sword as well, so that she has one in each hand. Okay, perfect. Um. To which case, uh, she says, she she says that herself. She's like, excellent, that's perfect. So you you can see well enough to pull your swords out. Um, can you see this then? Uh, and she moves her hands again. <laughs> and I need you, please, to make a wisdom saving throw. Eleven. Okay. Um, you see her move her hands. One hand kind of moves in front. And then you see her kind of make a fist. And as you're moving your swords about, um, you immediately cannot. You find yourself stuck in place. Um, entirely unable to move. I think someone um, just cast hold person. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. 
<laughs> and the mm -hmm. moment that you find yourself stopped, Cynthia starts walking towards you. And <laughs> I'm let me see here. Again. I, I looked this up. I know the rules. Um paralyzed. So you are considered paralyzed. Um Cynthia walks up to you immediately and swift movements and very easily she's able to remove one of those swords from your hand. And it's you 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 do get a little bit of a <laughs> about it because it's weightier than I think than maybe she expected and she kind of like fumbles it a little bit. <laughs> um but she takes the sword and she uh, kind of tosses it behind her. And then she takes your other sword. And this one she keeps in her hand and she steps back. And this, all this time, her hand is still in the motion um, that she had made when she cast this, she appears to have cast the spell on you. Um, and she says, um, so there's your first lesson that maybe you should get a little more familiar with magic and maybe instead of walking around with your big bright beautiful golden armor and your big great swords that aren't doing you any good anymore maybe you shouldn't be on such a high horse and she steps back towards um you can also see in the center of the room um is this kind of cut out in the ground. It looks like a, a prepared, like a pit. Um, it's like a, it's not a complete straight line. Um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll show you in roll 20 what this room looks like because I can do that. <laughs> Let's drag you guys over to. Just to, for, for you, she <laughs> does, Viola also has a rapier in her belt and a dagger. I don't know if she would have seen the dagger, but she would have seen the rapier if she was taking everything. She just took what was in your hand, those two swords. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so one sword she threw. So are you over in, um, are you able to see roll 20 now? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So you can see where you're standing up near the front. You can see where she is over by this pit. Um, and she has one sword on the ground right by the edge, the other one she's holding. And she says, uh, you know what else magic can do that you just strutting around can't do? She takes the sword that she's holding, and this one she just drops into this pit. And you see her kind of eye you for a moment as she holds her hand out uh, over the pit as well. And she starts to make another... She seems to start to make another motion with your hand. Give me another wisdom saving throw. That's a nat 20. <laughs> there we go. Break I knew I chose to use the Viola dice for Jump a reason. Kicker. Yes, Give her the yes. drop kick. It was a 22. <laughs> <laughs> um, Healing 22. Just as she's starting to hold her hand out over the pit <laughs> where she had dropped that that second sword, you feel yourself starting to be able to move again. Um, but she is hold, holding her hand, and it you you don't know what magic can do. She's holding her hand over the pit where she had dropped that sword. Oh, look, you and can move again. Viola's gonna grab her dagger and her rapier. Okay. And move towards Cynthia and try to swing at her with her rapier. Okay. Because <laughs> um, you said she dropped one of Viola's swords into the pit, correct? Correct. Okay. One of them is yeah. in the pit. Um... Get her. Get her. Get her. <laughs> there is a She's shot not back. swinging like at her face or like and any vital organs or anything like that, like an arm or a leg or something like that. You're calling a non-lethal, <laughs> a non-lethal hit. Yeah. Okay. Followed by um, a lethal shove. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Go ahead and roll your attack. Uh, 15. Uh, a 15 will hit. Oh, someone didn't bring shield. Oh, <laughs> shoot. I'm sorry. Hold on. Oh, wait. Never mind. I didn't right. say that. No. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Hold on. I'm sorry. How much does mage hand add? I mean, not mage hand. A mage armor add? Well, mage armor adds 13 plus whatever her dexterity plus is. Six. And then if she has shield, that's a reaction thing. So that's the thing that I was referencing. And that just adds five to your AC. Okay, and what did you roll, Viola? She got 15. 15. Okay, so that just hits even with her, her mage armor, which was the first thing she cast while she was just fancifully mm. around with her hands. Nothing happening here. She was casting gotcha. mage armor. Um, yep, yeah, but 15 will hit. Uh, so for damage is going to be 11. Golly. My gosh. <laughs> so you describe how you're non-lethally hitting her with this rapier. She's just going to charge forward and just take a slash at her thigh. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you do that and you can see like the dress kind of tear uh, as she's um, trying to like get out of the way as you come charging at her. And she kind of rolls and she kind of turns in the direction of where the other sword is and um, makes an attempt to kick that down into the pit as well. Uh, um, let's go ahead and just for the sake of it, let's go ahead and properly roll some initiative and see if she has time to do that beforehand. I got a so dirty 20. Found. I don't have oh, her connected I guess to the I can. It's okay. I mean, there's only oh, two okay. of them, so. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, no. Um, so she seems surprised, perhaps, by your sudden lunging and your fantastic um, prowess with a sword. Uh, so you do have the first initiative in this proper round. As she's, she's about to attempt to kick the other sword down. Viola's going to try to grapple her. Like, because she said she fell over, right? Or no? She didn't, she's not prone, no. She okay, was just well then, trying to get out of the way. But you're essentially... Viola right is going to try to knock her to the ground and, like, get on in top of her. and Not in the pit. <laughs> Why not the pit? <laughs> Why not the pit? <laughs> it doesn't look that deep from here. It is uh, a little deep. Viola's going to try to grapple her and just, like... Well, let's see if she can grapple her first. Mm -hmm. What do I need to roll for that? It's going to be opposed strength rolls. Of which I can't roll on. Uh, 19. I feel like unless she gets a nat 20, you got her. Yeah, <laughs> that's only a, that's only a seven plus her strength, which is not going to be a 19. <laughs> All right, so you you want to tackle <laughs> and grapple? That's yeah, uh, Viola's going to tackle her, pin her down. She's got her dagger in her left hand, and she's going to hold it up towards Cynthia's throat, but not fully <laughs> at her throat, just lower down. And in a very <laughs> serious tone of voice, Viola's going to say, Cynthia, I do not want to fight you. I do not know what the issue is, but those swords are the last thing I have of my mother. And I would like them back. But I will hit you again if I need to. And she is struggling in this, in your grasp. Um, she's going to try and break free. So is that just another strength check? It's going to be another opposed strength check, correct. 17. Nope, she's not able to break free. Um, and she struggles in your grip. And um, she just 
glares at you. Um, but she doesn't respond, and she she stops. She stops struggling. She, but she stops. She just doesn't look at you, and it doesn't respond. She just doesn't look at you. Is there a way for like how deep is the pit? Is it easy for me to get down there and get my sword? It looks like it's about fifteen feet. Deep. And I don't see a way, like any steps or a ladder down into it. No, it looks like it's. Uh, it looks like it was made very purposefully, but there's no actual entrance. You just have to go in. Uh, give me um. From your words, give me a persuasion. I should ask for a persuasion check. Uh, fifteen. Um, she's not looking at you, uh, and she doesn't say anything, but you can see there's some kind of internal struggle on her face that she is not willing to verbalize. Um, and all she says, since she can't actually move herself, is just, get off, or I can't get it. Viola, before she gets off, she'll pull the dagger away, but before she gets off, she's going to say, Cynthia, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to get off, and I'm going to put my swords away. I'm asking you as kindly as I can right now, please don't break this little bit of trust I'm giving you and get my sword back. And Viola will get up, and put her rapier, sheath her rapier, put the dagger in her belt, and pick up the other sword, short sword that's on the ground. Okay. Um, and she just slowly sits up, and she absolutely refuses to make eye contact with you. But she does, um, you see her reach her hand over the pit, and you watch her hand kind of motion again in ways you don't quite understand. But you can imagine magic is being cast again as this kind of spectral hand sort of separates from her own hand and goes down into the pit. And then a moment later, you see it come up first with one sword that it lays on the ground, goes back in, lifts the other sword. And maybe this one is a little bit higher up off the ground before it the hand disappears and the sword just kind of flops to the ground. Um, Viola and- will... Ben, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Viola will bend and pick up the other one. Um, and she's going to look at Cynthia's eyes, whether she's looking back at her or not. I just realized all this serious conversation is happening with the owl thing on her face. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to make a great scene in the movie one day, guys. <laughs> okay. But Viola will pick up her other short sword, put it in the sheath, and she's going to look at Cynthia in the eyes, whether she's returning the eye contact or not, and just say, thank you. You're great at what you do, and I can't do that, and I'm very impressed the way you were able to pick that up with that little magic hand, whatever you call it, and whatever you did to make it so that I couldn't move very impressive you're great at what you do and Viola will like pause for a second to see if she's going to say anything right away she is staring at the door and all she says is um it was a mage hand and I cast hold person it's easy some people she stands up brushing herself off and she says you know some people aren't so fortunate to just have mothers they want to remember she starts marching towards the door Viola probably lets a little tear slide down her cheek don't feel sympathy for this (laughs) way Um, 
And then she'll follow her out the door. Okay. Um, Cynthia is... Um, so, so, the door, um, for precaution purposes, the door is not able to open so easily from this side. Um, <laughs> so she stops at the door and has to, like, bang on it. And very shortly after, Ziva opens the door. Well, someone opens the door. It's not Ziva. It's one of her friends. And Cynthia doesn't say a word. She just storms out. Winna looks at where Cynthia is headed, looks back at you, kind of gives a moment of a questioning look, but doesn't stay long enough for the answer, and just runs after Cynthia. And Gary is still not looking at anything. He's just dealing with his piece of wood and whatever carving tool he's got in his hand. Um, Ziva does come down the steps again as she had left and came back after Cynthia had run up, sees you exiting, and she is now wearing something different. She had changed uh, as if it were the end of her shift, maybe. She is now wearing also just a very plain blouse and trousers. She's got these little normal looking spectacles on her face. <laughs> very normal looking. And now you can see she's got this little bracelet on with this cute little this little teeny metal charm on it and just looks very that's like the, the the most adornment she's got going on otherwise very very plain and she looks back up at looks over at you what the heck i mean there's some sort of animosity there don't tell me how it's come about we just don't always get along um but she picked the wrong button to push and so I may have given her a little slice on the leg, but clearly I didn't take her head off, so everything's fine. Yeah, if you took her head off, it'd be a little <laughs> difficult to uh, finish the experiment, I suppose. Yeah. Can't really but see. the goggles were great. They're wonderful. <laughs> I wish great. I had a pair. Well, can't have these, but hey, uh, honestly, look, Cynthia's not that bad. She just has a chip on her shoulder. Long story. I'm sure she can explain. But uh, honestly, someone probably needs to put her in her place every now and then. Just stop. But good yeah. for you. Uh, since you did that, probably did her a favor, even if she won't admit it. Uh, look, if you want to borrow them sometime, just find me. Ask. Or ask Gary. I think he, he's a novice like you are. You can probably find him sooner. Um, just tell him. Probably fetch him for you, too. Find one of us. We'll see if we can hook you up. Okay, that sounds wonderful. I will most definitely do that. Thank you so much for that experience. It was actually pretty gratifying in a few different ways. Um, I guess if there's anything else you want me to test, I am a willing participant. Well, if you've still got time, okay. So she'll spend the next hour or so with you, however long you anticipate before you go back to meet the others and just bring you back into that room and test out a few other on little nifty things. You uh, you leave Kepner's command having now experienced goggles of night. You got to try this these cool boots that first you didn't really want to put on because they did not at all go with your gorgeous armor. But she assured you you would really like it. And when you put them on and you started to step, you found yourself stepping so quickly you almost hit one of the walls. You moved so fast. She called them Boots of Haste. Boots of Haste, that one. But you know what? Also Boots of Elven Kind. You found yourself super stealthy, which is unusual because <laughs> you get this beautiful armor, but it does not help with that at all. So you also got to try those. And you left Kepner's Command feeling really good about yourself uh, before you met the others at the end of the evening. So we will jump back <laughs> in time. After Bo leaves from. Uh, Maria and the tutoring. You guys had something else you want. Did anyone have anything else they wanted to do before the day was done? Since I think tomorrow was the plan day to talk to Aglin at Saker's Keep. Do you mean before going to bed, or do you just mean like if there's anything mean? else? Yeah, anything before bed. If there were other things you guys wanted to do, I didn't know exactly what the rest of the plan was for today. <laughs> When we all go back, Snow is going to watch Stan to see if she actually goes into the barracks or if she is going to go leave again. 
to sleep outside of the temple. <laughs> Stan would actually look for a map. She's trying to figure out where the cemetery or graveyard this place is. <laughs> Lo and behold, it's at Saker's Keep. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. There is a section of Saker's Keep behind it that is actually utilized for both. One side of it is utilized for gardening. They have herbs and um, some fruits and things like that. The other side is this long strip that is used as a cemetery, memorial, mausoleum type thing. That is where she would head instead of going back into the barracks. No, follows her. Going to Saker's Keep. So there is a path that doesn't, you don't necessarily have to go through the building itself to go around towards this garden and cemetery combination <laughs> in the back. Um, <laughs> but you do pass by a small, what appears to be like a training yard on your way through. You see, it is getting towards the evening, so it is much emptier. There's a couple of people who are out there who seem to be maybe like doing some evening calisthenics. And then there's a couple of acolytes who are standing just kind of watching for a little bit one of them wanders inside at some point and one stays to observe but past them you'd find this very long stretch of sort of a cobblestone road you see the herb garden on one side and you see the cemetery and the grave plots on the other what would you like to do stay and will walk to the grave side she gives the herb garden a bit of a glance and just shakes her head and looks for a place to sit down amongst the tombstones she seems very comfortable doing this, like this isn't out of the ordinary. She'll nod at Snow, who's following her. Are you stealthing behind her, or you're just following along? No, he's just he's just following. You're just curious to see where she's spending the night these days. <laughs> she still hasn't been so. back. There's this little pouch of sand waiting for her. <laughs> yeah, and she hasn't seen it yet. So, sleeping in the graveyard, is that the plan? It is. Very spooky. I like it. Not really. It. Do you know that there's this there's this creature made of living shadow that just feeds on you for a while until you just like waste away. Very dramatic. Very spooky. That, that does sound dramatic. But I doubt there's any of those around here. Ah no, they're very rare. So why the graveyard? It's more peaceful, and it's always been a safer place. Not many, many people wander of? into them. I'm not sure. Just always found that I can settle more easily, surrounded by the dead than the living. And she'll pat the ground next to her. Do you want to sit? He'll drop his backpack on the ground and sit down next to her, crisscross. First time I spent a night in a graveyard, I, I was a child. Probably eight or nine. And it's been a habit ever since. You didn't have a house to sleep in, or did you just not prefer that? I didn't prefer it. That's fair. I didn't prefer my house either. So it was always more a house than a home. I think home is the people, not the place. So is Taryn home for you then? She is. That's beautiful. I miss her a lot. When's the last time you saw her? Oh, um, let's see. I guess it would have been just over a year ago. A year and a few months. I don't know, something like that. That's a long time. The days kind of blend together when you've been on the road a while, as I'm sure you know. Very true. But that's a long time to go without seeing without seeing her, without being at home in any sense. Well, there's always lettuce, and he <laughs> reaches into his backpack and pulls out an enormous stack of letters that are tied together with twine. <laughs> oh my. We write a bit. <laughs> and you keep everyone. Of course. That's beautiful. I don't like, I don't really like um, throwing things out because the memory, you know, connected to each thing. And you don't want to. As you might to. have noticed from the weight of my backpack. It was... It's a heavy bag, and I suspect its weight is as much uh, a mental weight you carry with it as it is the physical weight on your shoulders. A very poetic way of saying it. Have you ever thought of being a bard? No, but there's lots of things I um, hadn't thought of until recently. Yeah, so you didn't know that you were an ASMR? That's wild. No, and I'm still not, still not sure I believe it. I want to. What did you think you were? I didn't know. But you must have when thought I was, about it. When I was a child, the town whispered about if I had turned feral. We knew it wasn't true, but that was a thought. Ah, uh, thought of somehow maybe I'd taken to becoming an elf, like my father's parents might have been. Father's father would have been. Or just somehow different in another way. I cannot even imagine that. That's wild. I wish I just had to imagine it. Do you want to hear a story? Sure. So, once upon a time, there were two noble families. The Flintholmes 
and the Brookstones. And these families, while both alike in dignity, held for generations a deep grudge against each other, and they constantly plotted against the other, resorting to darker and darker means to overcome their opponents. And their conflict was known far and wide, with even the stars looking down from their heavenly dance with trepidation, as the monsters of the dark watched and crept around them, ready to devour the two families as they fought each other. Then, Atala, in her wisdom, sent from beyond the dawn the very first Asmar, Josephus, or Joseph in common, born to both elvish and human parents, and yet altogether otherworldly. His skin was pale, his eyes golden, and his hair darker than pitch. Strong he was, and when he spoke, everyone gazed up at him, flying in the sky like a feathered angel of old. He spoke to the flint homes and brookstones, warning them of their peril. And when the dark monsters of the midnight hour became enraged at the peace being brokered, they attacked, and it was Josephus, the light spun who helmed the defense and won great glory, saving both families with his valor. For none could withstand, it is said, his countenance in battle. His sword rang like the clearest bell, and his shield was so bright that it mirrored the stars like a mountain pool, with the light spun's cry of vivere, or in common, to live, his enemies quailed and fled. When the true foes were defeated, Josephus turned to the two quarreling families and rebuked them, reminding them that ever the dark seeks to divide those who stand against it. The greatest weapons of the dark are deceit, division, and ignorance. Praising Josephus for his aid, the two families came together, and as a sign, lasting, lasting sign of forgiveness, married into each other, and thus did the two become one stronger family and many, many generations later, along came a half-elf with snow-white hair and an excellent sense of style. The end. Is that, is that your family history, then? Could be. I'm really mad at that. Is that why you call your initial point to the medallion? Is that why that's Joseph? It is a favourite uh, story of mine. I used to tell it a lot to Tara, and she enjoyed it. Um, and we enjoyed acting it out in the woods behind our, our house. Um, so yes, it was it was just the first name that came to mind. <laughs> There's no other connection than that. It was just the first thing that popped into my head. But that's lovely. What a what a story indeed. That's really quite beautiful. The power of the light will triumph. It always does. Which is why even in the night, nothing can dim the light of the stars. That's one reason I like to be outside at night, apart from it being habit. So long as the stars are still shining, there's hope in the world. Is it that, or is it because you are hiding? That's what I thought. Yes, I do hide a lot. You call yourself the coward, I'm the one hiding from the world. Uh, I prefer running, you prefer hiding. It's all the same. Maybe we're all afraid of something. Maybe so. Maybe so. I don't think I want to be afraid of death anymore. You don't? You can see that he's shaking very slightly as he says this. She'll put a gentle hand on his shoulder. Death is something in many ways inevitable. In many ways, something we'll all have to experience at least once. I fear some people experience it more than that. But there can be a beauty found in it. A peace. A sense of knowing you've done what you were here to do. And so you can go forth and rest from that. Or you fought your fight as long as you could and now receive the embrace of peace. Sometimes it's much more tragic. Mankind makes it cruel, and yet I don't think that's what it was meant to be, nor what it actually is when it happens. Why is it always about fighting, though? That's all we're good at. That's all we know to do most of the time, it seems. So much more, though, to do than that. Like singing and telling stories and keeping hope alive in a world that despairs. Just saying, I've seen a lot more smiles come about from these things than from fighting. Not to say some people don't enjoy it, but... I'd agree with you there. So is that Atala's view as well, then? Fighting the good fight to end one's death? I think so. That's what I've 
trying to discern that that would be what she what she views, what she says. But sometimes now, I'm wondering if I should question more of what she said or not said, and revealed or not revealed. I think there's a lot I was certain of that now I'm not as sure of. She reaches into her bag and takes out the pendant she had put there a while ago. It's like, I want to hold this again, but I think tonight I need a break from it. What do you think that will bring you? A break from it, I mean. Honestly, just see if she notices. She can't do much worse than's happened the last few you nights, know, so... You know, you might be special, that doesn't mean you're your goddess's favourite. I don't think I'm anyone's favourite. Well, I wouldn't I say that, but it also doesn't really matter, because, forgive me, but, um, it's a little bit petty of you. It is. Don't you think? And this, I'm not trying to be, uh, not trying to attack you in this at all, you're not the only one, the holy symbol in there. But he'll reach into his bag and he'll pull out a medallion, an amulet, that has the symbol of a warhammer on it. That? I was never a cleric, but I do know what it's like to dedicate, or at least attempt to dedicate one's life to a deity's set of ideals and for it to not come to anywhere. And so, from that experience, I can say, I really don't think that's your path. I think when you're unsure of yourself and where you are and what you're doing, that's the time that you hold on to what you do know and what you are certain of. And I think, I think you do know this. You can't just let me be petty for once, can you? <laughs> now, where's the fun in that? One day I want to know more about you and Duel, dear. That is not much to know. I was an acolyte for a few years, that's it. A few years? That's not an insignificant period of time. I mean seven years, specifically, but... Seven years, and how old are you? Uh, let's see, what day is it? Um, I'm, I'm about to be 30 tomorrow. However old you are, seven years is a long time. It's longer than I spent in a temple at once. Honestly, it got pretty dreary. I imagine you got quite bored. But, how oh boring. Gosh. But, uh, you and I are not alike in temperament, so I think, I, I, I think you would be just fine. Indeed. Hold on to what you know. You win this night. And she'll take off her glove and start wrapping her amulet back around your hand. You're wise. No, I just like being right, it's all. I think it's a very normal thing to like to be right. <laughs> Thank you. You might be the first person to ever say that I'm normal. I don't think it's a bad thing to be normal in some ways. But if your whole life is defined by your normalcy, you're missing the point. You're also missing the fun. You can't do that. He'll lean back using his backpack as uh, a pillow and just start playing a little tune on his pan flute. Not very loudly and not very upbeat, but just nice. Are you staying out here tonight then too? Stops playing. Well, no one deserves to be alone. People spend too much of their lives alone already. Thank you. And Stan will lay back, taking out her bedroll and setting up a setting up to sleep. Is Snow going to be joining her? Does he have his bedroll prepared? <laughs> well, he just bought one, so he would have it on his hand. It's true. Yes, I do. <laughs> he bought it today uh, and then never put it back, and there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like the things work purchase. out. No, yeah. After <laughs> he takes off the tag, he'll, he'll finish. <laughs> <laughs> Rip off the... hear a bunch of plastic <laughs> ripping. He ain't no Jared. There's a tag on the edge of the bed that's like, do not remove. <laughs> do not Chaotic remove. good rip. Immediately rips it off. I don't like how it, I don't like how it tickles my neck. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> he would. He would, he would absolutely. I wonder Hane's going to be invented when they have the tagless tags. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he'll he'll play his pan flute for for a little while while Stan is setting up her own bedroll. Once it looks like she's done, he'll put it away and he'll get out his own bedroll, set it up, and pull out a pack of letters from his bag and just start rereading some of them. Stan, are you paying attention to him as he does this at all, or are you? Yeah, she's watching. Busy? She's curious. Okay. I'm going to briefly interrupt Stan. When you are, uh, your bedroll and such, that's all in your pack? Mm-hmm. Okay. Can you please give me a perception check? Yes. Oh, oh boy. 
That is a 25. Golly. <laughs> yeah, you're going through your pack and you're getting ready for bed and something just pings in your mind like something's not here. Something you had just received oh. today. <gasps> <laughs> 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 just happened to notice it's not there. That's weird. You must have. She'll look around. No, you haven't seen that handbook, have you? What handbook? The the novice handbook. I thought you I put did it. A handbook. It... It... That's incredibly got... dull. What would we want that for? It was in my mailbox this morning. I had it flipped through a few pages, and then we had to deal with things. I thought I put it. I bet they have replacement copies. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you could ask at the barracks. Snow makes a mental note to destroy all copies <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I'm surprised her first thought wasn't just like, but I was, I was with Bo when I checked the mailbox. Right <laughs> Maybe Bo or Viola knows where it went. It could have fallen out when we were walking around. We have had a oh, busy day. Very busy day. All right. Those letters are interesting. He's... You notice that this is an entirely different pack of letters, and this one is even thicker than the last one. <laughs> so that's another pack of letters from Taryn. No, this is from someone else. You would estimate there to be around 50 letters in this pack. <laughs> that's a lot of letters. Who else? Who else do you write? Uh, no one anymore, but we used to write often. Did something happen to them? I don't know, but they don't correspond with me anymore. I'm sorry. It seems like letters mean quite a lot to you, and that's got to be got to be a challenge. You notice in the letter that he pulls out, you can probably see because you have ridiculously high perception. <laughs> that is, uh, this one is clearly more worn than any of the others, and inside you get a glimpse of a portrait of someone. What does the portrait look like? You see, it is a female, looks to be elvish, has bright green eyes and brown hair. It's just a face portrait, so you don't get much more than that, other than you can see that she is wearing a, quite a bit of jewelry. I think she and Viola would get along. She seems to like the shiny things. Yes, she does. She has excellent taste. She must mean a great deal to you. Why do you say that? You carry her portraits, and it's... Porn. It's obviously something you probably look at often, and I can't imagine you'd do that uh, for someone unless you care about them. I mean, you don't maybe were sworn enemies. Nemeses. One day to meet on the field of battle and see whose will is stronger. I don't think that's how that is, but if that's what you want to say, I won't press. She was lovely. She was. Still is, I'm sure. Maybe one day you'll get to see her again. I don't think that's what she wants. I see. I'm sorry. He folds up the portrait again, but you see in the corner a name is written. Ivy. Apologize for prying, but thank you for sharing. I mean, I called you out for being petty just five minutes ago, so, I mean, you're well within your rights. Did the letters bring you joy still, then? I don't know. No. No, I, I, guess, I guess they don't. So why hold on to the memory? I don't know. Have you ever had a memory that doesn't that feels current yes for her, Many. this is the past but for me this is still the present i see i hope you find peace however it goes that one day it may be something that is able to just be a memory or maybe more wherever fate or life brings it or doesn't fate's what you make of it is it i like to think so it's a unique position but you are a unique one so i suppose it fits thank you I do my best. I'll let you get back to your reading. He, he like, he wipes something away from his eye and puts the letters back in his pack. Just lies back and stares up at the stars. Sleep well, Snow. You two stay in. That, you two make yourselves comfortable and sleep among the stars. In a graveyard. <laughs> I feel like this is a much more comfortable situation for stay in than it might potentially be for snow but don't let me speak for your character of course before the night is over Bo, you had something you wanted to do as well yeah so he was going to go out so on the maps is there like an area that's kind of 
I don't know, looks like it would have like the night activity or something like that, or just like general, like somewhat traffic, but not a ton of traffic. You could, there's um... also, is there anything about crime rates in any of the wards in the area <laughs> on any of these bulletins everywhere? Give me an investigation <laughs> check. If it's a nat 20, you might even find another poster. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be that. Dang. Uh, it's going to be a 13. You don't see anything that's listing statistics like that, or even from the notices that are up on any of the boards. It's not very clear. Well, mainly um, it however, was like if there's other wanted things. Oh, yeah. No, you're not, you're not spotting any of those. However, you... You can kind of discern just, you, you didn't spend a ton of time in cities, but of the ones you did, you can kind of discern there are some areas that you might imagine, you know, there might be some nightlife just based on vendors that might be in the area. Even if there are like late night residential people air, uh, up and about, there's residence wards. And then like heading for a little further south, there are some areas that might have some activity, potentially. You're looking for seedy corners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So go to, uh, I guess, one of those. So you're heading kind of back in the southward direction? If that's where they are, yeah. Sure. What are you looking for in this area? So how many people are about, like, going to and from? And is there, like, outside vendors, or is everything basically, like, indoors? It's mainly brick-and-mortar stores. There's alleys, you know, people... What time is it at this point? So this is basically immediately after you've left? No, this is before going to bed. So you left Stormwatch Tower. You left the library. I don't know how much time you spent between then and now. It would have been like around dinner by the time you left Maria. I mean, I was figuring like bed is probably okay, sometime so between 10 and noon. Oh, and midnight. So it'd been sure. like maybe nine. Yeah. So stores are, yeah, stores <laughs> are closed. St stores are closed at, at this point. It's like, I think All it's, of I'm them? pretty sure. What kind of nightlife is this? <laughs> at nine o'clock? <laughs> it's not, this is not New York City. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's plenty of places in New York City that are open past it's... nine. <laughs> you said between ten and midnight. No, I said he oh, was planning on going to bed between ten and midnight. Oh, I thought you meant you were looking. No, you were trying to gauge the time, and I was saying that it was before oh. he was planning on going to bed. Okay, I'm sorry. There was a misunderstanding. We are now communicating. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Then repeat your question for me. You were looking for like how many people are out and about. There's that, and like, is there any like outdoor vendors? Like, what, what does it, I guess, look okay. like? So what you see is there's scattered about brick and mortar stores mainly. Uh, you might see a couple of carts. It's still not super duper active, but there's people milling about. It's more things like uh, like game stores. There's like a art. There's an art vendor, little things like that. But yeah, it's, it's some streets, there's alleys, there's people milling about. So he doesn't have technically, like if anyone paid close eye, like expensive stuff, but he does have like trinkets that look like they could be expensive, but they aren't from his disguise kit. So he's just gonna okay. put on some things that make it look like he has something of value and not really anything and then he's just gonna continue to browse around if there's like art stuff he might go look over that if he does find a chance though he will buy a dice set <laughs> if any of these gaming <laughs> things have just like a dice set a plain old dice set like well so what he needs is a not magical he dice needs, set unlike what he needs like has. 12 <laughs> d6s essentially is what he's looking okay. for <laughs> so if you bought two sets of 66s in a bundle, you'd have 12 D6s. You want to buy dice, a set yes. of dice. Yes. Okay, we can, yes. Wow, While also looking awesome. like this. And he's going to be trying to see if anyone starts tailing him from this. Okay, so go ahead and roll me. Let's see, you're trying to look trying to look expensive well buying dice like you want to look like bait <laughs> <laughs> um, I will allow you, so please roll for me either a charisma it's charisma performance or do. a deception I'll it's one you. or the other yeah either All performance right. or deception oh my gosh 11 yeah it's not hard to kind of look the part of 
either I'm very rich and I don't know what to do with all this money or I have some money and I'm not careful with it. It takes you probably a little longer than you'd hoped, but you might get the sense that there's some eyes on you. Like, you know, just if you weren't careful, something might come off of your pouch, your hip. And as I go from place to place, are any of the eyes following me, I guess you can say? Like, is anybody trailing after him? Give me a perception And check. also, if he did find the dice, I need to know how much it is. <laughs> I can find that for you. A dice set is a silver piece. Oh, two sweet. Two silver pieces for two, for two to complete the amount right, of dice. And his next dice roll is a 10. <laughs> it's a... Uh... <laughs> You're hopeful, you're just not totally sure, but you think maybe you might be able to? You think maybe some of those eyes are following you. But again, it's taking you longer than you'd hope, and you're kind of annoyed by it. <laughs> that was a 10 on your perception roll? Yes. So as you're walking about, though, milling about, say shortly after you manage to get your hands on this dice set, you leave that shop. There's an alley uh, between this kind of game shop and then this, like, art building next to this art store next door. As you're walking and you turn the corner a sight kind of takes you by surprise you see actually first go ahead and roll me a dexterity saving throw oh boy tell me it's a nat one it's an eight <laughs> yay 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 <laughs> oh no oh my gosh i'm moving and this dice to the side <laughs> i was gonna say you need to dice, dice in jail you're going straight to dice jail what is your armor class 14. <laughs> Oof. Rip. Maybe not. Maybe not. Wait, was that a saving throw or is it just a regular? I called it a saving throw. Oh, then it's um, a uh, 10. Ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> In that case. <laughs> yeah, I, for, I forgot you're out of psionic dice, too. Oh, no, that's right. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> oh, that's, that's why we were resting. <laughs> we weren't going to do anything more today. <laughs> Well, actually, did he have enough time for a short rest and all that downtime? Because he probably would have been down for like an hour while he ate dinner. Yeah, I'll allow a short rest. Okay, so he has one psionic dice. Yeah, so you come around this corner and it doesn't catch you, but you see a fist come swinging in front of you as you see someone dressed in a brown cloak take a swing at you and kind of try to shove you aside as you're coming up. Go ahead and roll initiative for me. On our next tail. Dang it! Don't! No witnesses! Get rid of him! Blood starts coming down his eyes and his nose and his ears. <laughs> These guys came around. I was doing patrol and they jumped me. Yes, I promise she's all right. I do not know why she chooses to not sleep in her bed. We're going to set up the funeral rites as best as we can. And I wondered if Stain wanted to assist with that. And actually, someone's coming in uh, to uh, collect an item at Weirg. We're going to be selling it and uh, very excited. Can They're I use this precipitation to soil the floor where Bo was standing? Oh, you know, there's a back tool. Oh, Stan told him about a back door. Why would she <laughs> tell him about a back door? <laughs> We don't have time for this. <laughs> Jeremy, these men, we have very good reason to believe, are here to actually steal it and not deliver it like they're supposed to. Bo, you take eight damage as you feel something crack against the back of your head. 